This program tonight with Bill Carey is being sponsored by the Special Collections Department. And I'm the librarian in that department. My name is Marsa, and I'm happy to be hosting Bill. I'm so excited to hear uh, these true tales of Tennessee, and I think he's probably got some things we haven't heard before. A few things about Bill. Uh, he is a resident of Williamson County, and like he said, his son is graduating from eighth grade this week. And, so, and his other son, his older one, graduated uh, from Franklin High School four years ago. Bill first came to Nashville in 1983 to go to Vanderbilt University. He spent five years between 1987 and 1992 in the Navy, mainly in California, flying over the Pacific. He moved back to Nashville in 1992 and was a reporter for most of the 90s, working for, at various times, the Tennessean, the Nashville Scene, and NashvillePost.com, which he co-founded. He started the nonprofit organization at Tennessee History for Kids in 2004, and he has operated it continuously ever since. Many public school teachers in this state use the Tennessee History for Kids website and booklets as their Tennessee and U.S. History Social Studies curriculum. For the last 17 years, Bill has written a monthly history column for Tennessee Magazine, which also has a circulation of about a half a million people, households. And that's not people, that's more, more than half a million households. <laughs> So for the last three years, he has also written a weekly column that runs in about 40 small town newspapers in the state. You've probably seen that column in the Herald. We try to cut it out every time there's a, a, a new column to save it. And his previous books include, among others, Fortunes, Fiddles, and Fried Chicken, A Nashville Business History, and Runaways, Coffles, and Fancy Girls, A History of Slavery in Tennessee. It is my great pleasure to invite Bill Carey to the podium this evening. Okay. All right, thank you. I didn't think very much about this presentation in the past hour, so maybe I'll be really good because of it, you know? <laughs> didn't get a chance to get nervous or anything. Um, I'm gonna start by asking a question. The, the, this book covers a 43-year period of Tennessee history. You see, uh, 1811 to 1854. Before we get started, I wanna ask a quick question. How much has the world changed in the last 43 years? How many of you remember the year 1980? <laughs> I do. I was a little, well, I was 15 at the time. Do you think a little or a lot? A lot. A lot. As a matter of fact, I will maintain that what we've gone through is nothing compared to what people went through in the early 1800s. For example, what is the main way in which the world has changed? Technology. Technology. Was this, did they have libraries in 1980? Yes. Did they have cars in 1980? Yes. Did they have interstates? In the, did they have airplanes? Yes. So like when I went to college in, well, I was a sophomore in high school in 1980. The world was a lot different. We had shopping malls. Um, we had maybe five or six channels. Some people had cable and had like 20 channels, but we didn't have the entertainment options of today. I think the biggest thing is that internet has changed the world. But we all think about how much the world has changed. I think Franklin would be recognizable today than it was. It would just be a lot different. But, uh, but I want to focus on four things that changed the world in the early 1800s. And I think when we're done, I think you'll realize that what we've gone through is nothing compared to what the people went through at that time. And I'm going to start with the steamboat. Today, we paddled downstream. Ta-da! On the Harpeth. In the old days, people pulled keelboats upstream. Okay, none of you have ever seen a keelboat try to go upstream, have you? Our great, great, great grandparents might have seen it, but before we had the steamboat, 
It was a lot easier to go downstream. It was almost impossible to come upstream. Okay, and that's what the city of Nashville, that's, that's the problem that we had in Middle Tennessee, and that's, that's the problem every in, inland river had. It was easy to get to the ocean, easy to float stuff downstream, but it's a real problem to get stuff back downstream. And, and all this would change with a man named Robert Fulton. Now, I want to point out that my presentation is mainly about Tennessee history, but there's two times when I have to talk about discoveries that were started in other states that affected us. Robert Fulton came up with a new type of boat, one that would be powered by two steam engine driven paddle wheels on both sides of the hull. This was a new idea at the time. The only way to move a boat uh, by, was by sail uh, before this time, or by simply letting the current take you downstream, or, or by dragging it from the shore. Fulton teamed up with a man named Robert Livingston, who was a lawyer in New York. Together they built a steamboat using a steam engine that Fulton had designed. On August 17, 1807, Fulton's steamboat pulled out of New York Harbor and then headed up the Hudson River, which, by the way, was not called the Hudson River. Then it was called the North River. The many women, men and women lining the riverbank had never seen anything like it. 32 hours later, 32 hours later, the boat arrived at Albany, New York, having averaged about five miles an hour. Real quick trivia question. Robert Fulton unveiled two inventions that summer. The steamboat was one of them. The other one got more publicity at the time. Do y'all know what it was? The torpedo. If you look up the word torpedo in the dictionary, you will see that it was invented by Robert Fulton. Early, about two months before he, um, flo uh, he invented the steamboat, he, blow up, he blew up a boat in the same New York Harbor. And that made much more news because people like things that blow up. So, so in the one summer, he unveiled two things. Anyway, the steamboat, however, ended up being more profitable. By the way, he tried to get the British to invest in the torpedo, and they didn't want to have anything to do with it because the British had the world's largest navy. The last thing they want is to invest in something that will blow up ships. So they said, no, we're not interested. Anyway, he called his first steamboat the North River because the, the river was called the North River at that time. And um, after he got it back to New York, he and Livingston put chairs in it and began charging people to ride. By November, they were charging as, much, as, as many as 90 passengers, $7 each, to ride all the way from New York to Albany and Albany and back to New York. And that was a lot of money back then. Soon the two men built more steamboats to keep up with the business. Okay, so they're making good money. However, uh, so he had proven that he could do a steamboat that could move passengers up and down a calm river, such as the North River. But what about the great inland rivers? such as the Ohio and the Mississippi and the Tennessee. Well, Fulton and Livingston turned their attention to those, and so they began planning a great river voyage all the way to New Orleans. And this, by the way, is going to involve the place that we now know as Memphis, Tennessee, in case you're wondering what the connection is. It took Fulton and Livingston a couple of years to find investors. Okay? In doing so, they partnered with a clever inventor and boat builder named Nicholas Roosevelt. You've heard that last name before. In 1810, they sent Nicholas Roosevelt to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he started building the steamboat in which they would ride downstream. Why Pittsburgh? <coughs> what river starts in Pittsburgh? The Ohio River. Those of us who grew up watching the Steelers know that there's three rivers there, the Ohio and the other two that are really hard to name, right? The Allegheny, Allegheny and the Nantahala, right? Oh, that's embarrassing. Um, but anyway, there's three rivers there, and, and the Ohio River, they start calling it the Ohio there, and it flows all the way down, and, and this is a, I put together a couple of maps from 1812. When I first heard about this journey, I visualized a small steamboat with barely enough room for a few people, kind of like the one Humphrey Bogart drove in out of Africa. <laughs> but the New Orleans, as the steamboat was called, was actually 150 feet long, and had separate enclosed living spaces for men and women. It was steered from a small room on top of the living spaces. This boat wasn't just set up to go all the way to New Orleans one time. It was set up to go to New Orleans and then go back and forth from Natchez, just like it had gone from New York to Albany. The boat was driven by two steam-driven paddle wheels on both sides. This is a model that a guy has done. There were 
eight people on board when it launched. Nicholas Roosevelt, great uncle of Theodore Roosevelt, by the way, his wife Lydia, a pilot named Andrew Jack, not Andrew Jackson, but Andrew Jack, five deckhands and servants, and a dog named Tiger, who was a Newfoundland. Do y'all know what Newfoundlands look like? They look like that. They're like a bear, okay? And they drool a lot, but that happens to be the dog that they took. And yeah, they were stuck on the boat all day. It does kind of make you wonder, where did the bat? <laughs> they just threw that overboard, I guess. So they set off on this journey. On October 20th, 1811, the New Orleans set off down the Ohio River. A lot of people showed up to see the crew off and wish them well, probably say to themselves, we'll never see you guys again. With its engines operating, its two paddle wheels turning, and the current pushing it downstream, the New Orleans went about 10 miles an hour, faster than any boat had ever gone on the Ohio River. That night, Nicholas and Lydia were so excited that they couldn't sleep. They sat up on the deck, watching the forest pass in the moonlight. Oh, this is going to be such a peaceful, wonderful journey. Oh, you don't know. The next morning, the New Orleans made its first stop in Wheeling, Virginia, which is now called Wheeling's West Virginia. Roosevelt mailed some letters back to New York, bought some supplies, and let people come on board and tour the boat for 25 cents a head. People were impressed, and they wished Roosevelt and the crew the very best. But the visitors all pretty much said the same thing. This steamboat might be able to go downstream, but there is no way it could go upstream. Later that day and into the next, the crew of the New Orleans heard the same thing from people in Marietta, Ohio, and then Madison, Indiana, and then Cincinnati, Ohio. Is anyone here from Louisville, Kentucky? My wife is from Louisville, and she did not know this. The reason Louisville exists is because there was a dam, a series of rapids and dams there that were navigational barriers. When the New Orleans arrived in Louisville, Kentucky, Roosevelt realized he had a problem. There were a series of small waterfalls on the Ohio River, and no way the boat could get across them until rain caused the river to rise. He knew about this, but he thought the water might be higher, and it wasn't. So with nothing more to do, the New Orleans stopped in Louisville for a few weeks. And this is what the waterfalls would have theoretically looked like. The thing about the waterfalls is they look different if it's March, and if it's September, they look a whole lot different. So we already have the waterfalls. Meanwhile, there was something else taking place that made it an unforgettable time in American history. A few months earlier, a comet had appeared in the night sky. It was hard to see at first, but by October it was huge and people all over the world stared at it. Known, by, known today as the Great Comet of 1811, it made some people wonder if the world was going to an end. It also inspired the American leader to come see and is associated with Napoleon's invasion of Russia. Since the steamboat New Orleans threw flames, sparks, and smoke into the air, a lot of uh, people commented on his connections to the Great Comet of 1811. Were the comet and the steamboat somehow connected? Some believe they were. The Indians definitely believe they were. Um, the rains returned, and in late November, Roosevelt finally decided it was time to try to get the steamboat through the falls of the Ohio. This was an event that no one who was, ever, who was on board will ever forget. To pass through the falls, Andrew Jack steered the New Orleans to the deepest part of the river and headed downstream as fast as possible. Everyone on board held on tight because they knew that when the boat crossed over the waterfalls, and there was more than one of them, there would be a big drop. In fact, the boat might get stuck and tip over. Water from the rapids splashed through the air, and everyone held on for dear life, even the dog, right? <laughs> this is another picture of what the falls of that area looked like. The falls were so loud that the pilot standing at the front of the boat had to wave his arms to direct the helmsman which way to go to avoid this rock and that rock, and this tree trunk and that tree trunk, and this shallow spot and that shallow spot. Anyway, somehow they made it through. And as the crew left Louisville, I'm sure they thought the scary part of their journey was behind them. But they were wrong. Not long after passing the falls of the Ohio, the New Orleans made a stop which allowed everyone on board to go search for firewood. They did this like every day. All of a sudden, the earth shook and rumbled. After a few seconds, everyone realized that they had felt an earthquake. As it turned out, it was the first of hundreds of earthquakes. To be specific, there were 1,874 earthquakes during that three-month period. Wow. Um, today, we refer to these as the New Madrid earthquakes, and they took place on and off for about three months. Some were mild, but many were strong, 
strong earthquakes that cause bluffs to fall into the river, large cracks to appear in the ground, and big rocks to shoot out of the earth. In, sh in short, it was a scary time to be anywhere, especially on the Ohio River. <clears throat> um, as the New Orleans moved downstream, also, point this out, the crew began seeing Native Americans on both sides of the river, making them nervous. You see, there was a war on, okay? And it was uh, largely between the United States and some of the American Indian tribes. The Battle of Tippecanoe between American soldiers and warriors led by Tecumseh had occurred only a few month, uh, weeks earlier. Some of the Native, Native Americans might be peaceful, some might not. There was no way to know for sure. There was one scene where they're heading downstream and they see these canoes coming toward them, and they're kind of like, hmm, I'm not sure. And so they just speed up, and the canoes can speed up, and they, they finally they do a race, and they finally take off and leave them behind. So uh, back to the map. The Ohio River merged with the Tennessee and then with the Mississippi, but this was no longer the fun journey that the crew of the New Orleans had experienced before Louisville. With the fire, the earthquakes... Oh, did I mention that they woke up one night and the ship was on fire? Because somebody had... Uh, they thought they had been boarded and attacked. It turns out somebody had just left some firewood or too close to the fire, and it, it started. So, the, so they, they had a fire as well. With the fire, the earthquakes, and the uncertainty about the Native Americans, there wasn't much to laugh about. Earlier in the trip, the steamboat would stop in small towns and be boarded by friendly people who paid 25 cents a tour. Now it made occasional stops in small riverside villages where, where people came on board and begged to be taken away because the earthquake had destroyed their homes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the New Orleans didn't have enough supplies to take any of these people, so they had to turn them down. As the pilot, Andrew Jack's job was to steer the boat and avoid the dangers along the way. Jack had been up and down the Ohio and Mississippi River hundreds of times in flatboats and keelboats, but he got frustrated when the New Orleans turned south on the Mississippi River. You see, the earthquake had changed the river so much that he hardly recognized it. In some places, the riverbank had collapsed. In other places, the current had moved from this part of the river to that. So he was pretty much a rookie out there, and so it made him really mad. Anyway, sometime around Christmas, bringing this to Tennessee, the New Orleans passed the present-day site of Memphis. I'd like to tell you that there's a great story connected with its arrival, but in 1811, West Tennessee was still Chickasaw Indian Territory. The place later known as Memphis, was simply known as the Chickasaw Bluffs on the Mississippi River, and there wasn't anything but a trading post there. The steamboat may have stopped there, but we can't be sure. I suspect it did, but, but there's nothing in the logs about it. Uh, the journey of the New Orleans, they did make it all the way to New Orleans, uh, was very successful. It proved that steamboats could go up and down inland rivers such as the Ohio and the Mississippi. It proved that steamboats could pass through scary parts of the river, such as the Falls of the Ohio, and it proved that steamboats could keep their passengers and crew a lot safe and alive in spite of comets, earthquakes, fires, and disappearing islands. So that's the story about how Memphis got the steamboat. What about Nashville? Does anyone know what year the first steamboat made it all the way up to Nashville? Um, because I will tell you, uh, this is, uh, there are uh, numerous books that mention this. They're, they aren't really going to go to great detail, but this is probably the, the most uh, important in terms of being a primary source. But this book and all the others say that it was called the General Jackson and that made it up the, the Cumberland River to Nashville in 1819. They are all wrong. <laughs> because I found this ad... Let's just to be fair. How many of you ever ever gone to newspapers.com? Okay. It's not fair. Those of us, we can now dig up stuff that people couldn't dig up. It's just not fair to compare. But but I can tell you that I've probably dug up 45 things that are wrong in the history books. Okay. And this is 46. Because this is an ad that appeared in the Tennessee Gazette newspaper. And it says right here, the subscriber, this is an ad by has just received by the Steamboat Constitution from New Orleans, and this ad runs in July 23, 1818. So there was a steamboat called the Constitution that made it all the way to Nashville in June of 1818. So it wasn't 1819, and so it wasn't called the General Jackson. I hate to tell Opryland this, but it's true. Um, but 
whether, whether or not it was 1818 or 1819, uh, the steamboat, it, by the way, the reason it took more than uh, seven years to make it after it had gone is that there was a navigational barrier called the Harpeth Shoals, and it's about where Ashland City is today. It was really hard to get past the Harpeth Shoals, and so that was a problem, and it took a few years to get around slash through the Harpeth Shoals, but, uh, but we know that steamboats made it and then, and, and, and once the steamboat made it through, Nashville took to the steamboat very, in about five minutes, <laughs> they realized, okay, this is the way to go. And uh, despite the fact that there was a notable barrier, Nashville would grow dependent on the steamboat and the city's economy grew because of it. I've done some research and it's, it's in the book, a man named Yateman, Thomas Yateman, I think is his first name. But I talk about his career. He was a... Um, retailer on, on what is now called Second Avenue. I think it's still called Second Avenue, right? They haven't changed that yet, have they? Part of it's been changed to Ronald Reagan. Did you know that? But anyway, he got ahead of his, uh, his fellow retailers and he bought a steamboat and then he bought another steamboat and then he built a warehouse for steamboats. And, and anyway, but at some point he becomes hugely wealthy and Nashville really takes to the steamboat. Nashville uh, becomes the largest, uh, becomes much larger than Knoxville or Chattanooga because of the steamboat, because the Tennessee River is not as navigable as the Cumberland River is because of the Muscle Shoals of Northwest Alabama and the areas between Chattanooga and Huntsville, and there are several barriers to navigation. Uh, my favorite is called the Suck. Have y'all ever heard of the suck? It's on the map. I tell students, you can say suck as long as it's a noun. And, uh, but it was a hugely important area just south of, or just downstream from Chattanooga. There was one called the suck, one called the boiling pot, one called the uh, frying pan. And if you don't believe me, Johnny Cash did a song about this. You ever hear it? It took a mighty fine man. Please don't make me sing Johnny Cash. <laughs> but if Google it, if you don't believe me, there's a song he does it. You can find it on the internet. To me, that's kind of the more interesting parts of the book that talk about the steamboat. So think about this. The steamboat comes, and from the time the steamboat comes, you can now get to New Orleans. You can also get, take a steamboat to Pittsburgh, St. Louis, and you don't have to float just downstream. You can go to Pittsburgh and go float and then go upstream. All of a sudden, Places are closer, you're getting the mail faster, you're getting packages faster. Well, let me talk a little bit about how Nashville became the state capital. It's too late to ask yourselves whether Nashville wants to be the state capital. It's hard to imagine Nashville without the capital, the state office buildings, thousands of state employees, let alone the annual spectacle known as the Tennessee General Assembly. <laughs> Apparently it's now more than annual, right? But it almost turned out differently in, in fact, thanks to a Nashville's reputation as a den of political iniquity, the Capitol <laughs> nearly ended up in another place. And I'm not making this up. And by the way, the guy that said this was from Williamson County. And there's a road name for him, Sneed. For the first few decades of Tennessee's existence, the legislature could not agree on a permanent <laughs> capital. Knoxville was the first seat of government in 1796, followed by Nashville in 1812, Knoxville again four years later, Murfreesboro in 1819, and Nashville again seven years later. Along the way, in one of the strange footnotes of Tennessee history, Kingston served as state capital for one day in 1807. This is a building that was in Knoxville. You can probably see the word state capital. This was a state capital building in Knoxville. It's, you can get this at the State Library and Archives. This is not the state capital. This is a prison. Tennessee might have had a, a temporary capital for a lot longer had it not been for Governor William Carroll, who was governor for 12 years in the 1820s and 1830s. Carroll led the fight to create a chancery court, the state's first penitentiary, and the state's first insane asylum as homes for the mentally handicapped and mentally ill were then called. Can't call them the insane asylum anymore, right? Carroll was also responsible for, he has a really good hairdo, um, <laughs> Tennessee's first constitutional convention in 1834, a con convention that debated the idea of a permanent capital at some length. Like many legislative bodies throughout history, however, it could come to no consensus and therefore decided to force other people to make the tough decision some other time. 
The delegates recommended and the voters later approved a constitutional amendment requiring the legislature to pick a permanent seat of government by 1843. So when do you think they're going to pick it then? They're not going to wait till the last minute, are they? Oh, yes, they will. Now, what I'm reading now is from, largely from the book. So I'm, I'm going to read. This is a long slide, but you'll get a kick out of this. When the legislature met at the Davidson County Courthouse in October of 1843, they waited until the 10th month. It spent the first week arguing where to put the Capitol. House and Senate members took turns espousing the virtues of their hometown, proposing the seat of government be placed there. <coughs> then the vote would be taken, the measure would fail, and another representative or senator would stand up and espouse the views of his hometown. It went on and on. Over the course of the week, just about every organized community in Tennessee got its chance and lost. During the Senate debate on the morning of October 4th, Kingston, Lebanon, Hamilton, Hamilton is uh, Chattanooga, um, Sparta, Knoxville, Clarksville, McMinnville, Shelbyville, Murfreesboro, Chattanooga, Franklin, Harrison, and Woodbury were all considered and voted down. After lunch, the Senate considered and rejected Sparta again, Franklin again, Harrison again, and Woodbury. Then late on the afternoon of Wednesday, October 4th, the Senate passed a bill 13 to 12 to make Kingston the permanent capital of Tennessee. Over in the 75-member Tennessee State House, they were also going through an amusing tour through Tennessee. The House version of the bill started with the seat of government located at the center of the state. Where's that? Murfreesboro. The House then reconsidered and rejected the idea of putting the Capitol in Nashville, Carrollville, which is now known as Clifton, by the way, uh, Sparta, Carthage, Nashville again, Smithville, and Murfreesboro. After a lunch break, towns suggested but voted down included Knoxville, Jackson, Carthage again, Murfreesboro again, Savannah, Jackson again, Manchester, Murfreesboro, Lebanon, Sparta again, and Paris. Finally, in the er early evening, about the same time the Senate passed the bill to make Kingston the permanent capital, the House passed the bill making Murfreesboro the permanent capital. That night would have been an exciting night for Kingston and Murfreesboro, but the telegraph didn't exist yet. So these, these communities had no way of knowing that this was happening. Anyway, uh, on Friday the 6th, the House started up again. Quote, the name of almost every town from Sullivan to Shelby was successfully proposed, on Knoxville Post reported. House members have suggested and rejected Columbia, Harrison, Charlotte, Reynoldsburg, Shelbyville, Smithville, Manchester, Woodbury, Monticello, which is in Putnam County, and Chattanooga. This time, Chattanooga prevailed, which is interesting. I mean, Chattanooga was brand new. A few minutes later, the Johnson County community of Taylorsville prevailed. That's in the far northeast part of the state. Then Columbia prevailed. The House then spent the rest of the afternoon debating a measure to locate the state capital at, quote, the most eligible point within 10 miles of the geographic center of the state. Among the people who spoke in favor of this proposal, get this, was a man named Representative William Hawkins Polk of Murray County. Quote, a younger brother of the ex-governor, comma, and thought by some in his party to be a more talented man. This is before his brother became president. But the newspaper seems to think that William Hawkins Polk is the real brains in that family. Anyway, it eventually came down to, and I'll explain this ad in a second. It eventually came down to Nashville and Murfreesboro, and it was then on Saturday, October 7th, the debate got ugly. They always get ugly on Saturday. They want to go home. Several legislators said Nashville was a logical choice. After all, the legislature was used to meeting there. It had better road and water connections. It contained institutions such as the bank and prison that the legislature needed to keep an eye on. The city of Nashville was offer also offering the state a hill on which to buy the Capitol building. Acquired by attorney William Campbell years earlier as a fee for a lawsuit, several Nashville citizens had signed an option to buy Campbell's Hill for $30,000 and donate it to the state. This is the only ad I ever found that contains Campbell's Hill in it. There was a cow that had wandered off. A cow had been up. So before we get the Capitol building, there were cows up there. At least this one was. This is the only mention of Campbell's Hill that I found before this, or this debate. Lawmakers advocating Murfreesboro did not go down easily. State Senator Samuel McLaughlin of Warren County argued passionately against Nashville. 
pointing out that the geographic center of the state was in Rutherford County. In fact, he was right. At the behest of legislators from Rutherford County, the state had hired a mathematician to calculate the geographic center of the state, and he determined that the location was near Murfreesboro. All you have to do is take a map and draw two lines, but now they hired a politician, a mathematician. And in 1976, the Rutherford County Historical Society paid for an obelisk to be built at this geographic center, and you can find it just north of Middle Tennessee State University. Anyway, going back to the debate, Laughlin also noted that since the legislature had moved to Nashville 17 years earlier, the General Assembly was meeting for longer and the government had increased its annual expenditure and taken on tremendous debt. This, he said, could be contributed to the forces at work in Nashville, which he described as, quote, this political Sodom. State Senator William Henry Sneed, representing Rutherford and Williamson counties, agreed with his colleague and added points of his own. Quote, the people of Nashville are the creditor class, he said. They were traders, speculators, while the largest portion of the people elsewhere are farmers. The interests of the two classes are averse and their opinions are at variance. Sneed also made reference to Nashville's voluptuousness and dissipation. He also implied that the citizens of Nashville were bribing the legislature by offering it free land, which is a curious point considering Murfreesboro was also offering the legislature free land. That evening, the House voted 50 to 32 to make Nashville the state's permanent capital. The next day, the Senate concurred by a vote of 17 days. Two days later, the Republican banner had this to say. This is the newspaper. The question being thus settled, let all the unpleasant circumstances connected with the conflict for the location of the seat of government be laid aside forever. Let all thoughts of that controversy be buried in the grave of oblivion which it was until now, <clears throat> when I dug it up. So what became of Sneed? First of all, I do think that the road in the north part of this county is named for a member of his family. I don't think it's named for him, but he represented Rutherford and Williamson County, so it seems logical to me that that is named for a member of his family. What became of this guy? Well, two years after the state capitol debate, he got married to somebody in Knoxville. So he actually moved to Knoxville, which is kind of the opposite way people usually moved, and uh, set up a law firm practice there. One of his clients was the newly formed Hancock County, a county whose creation in 1844 had been legally challenged. Well, Sneed represented Hancock County in that lawsuit, which went all the way to the Tennessee Supreme Court, and which Hancock County won. In gratitude, the county seat, previously known as Greasy Rock, was renamed Sneedville. So it was named for this guy. And as if that's not weird enough, it gets weirder. Sneed was elected to Congress in 1855, and on the eve of the Civil War, was a leader in, Nash in Knoxville's secessionist movement. Knoxville is basically a Union town, but not this guy. And, and he was a Confederate through and through. This put him at odds with the meanest man in Tennessee history. Anyone know the name of that guy? Um, William Ganaway Brownlow, Parson Brownlow, uh, a unionist and newspaper editor who was probably the greatest insulter in Tennessee history. Brownlow hated Sneed so much that he advocated his execution in print. If you read some of these editorials, um, this is what he had to say about Sneed. Um, they have caused the hanging of better men than themselves or associates. They have instigated the shooting down of others and yet the, and the imprisonment of others. They have filled East Tennessee with widows and orphans. They have destroyed houses and barns, fences and homes. They have plundered honest men of their stock and grain. And they have filled the land with mourning. Let such imps of hell die the death of traitors and upon the shortest possible notice. So this is, and this man was the governor later, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, not only was he a Methodist minister and a newspaper editor, he later became governor, and it was, uh, he was governor in the late 1860s. Uh, it is not a complete coincidence that that was when the Klan started. He was incredibly unpopular. Uh, but um, there were people who came to his funeral just to make sure he was dead. Okay? <laughs> and he was the last governor from Knoxville until Haslam. That took a long time to forgive. But anyway, he did not like Sneed. And if you think things are bad now, in those days they basically said, oh, take him out and blow his head off. 
Okay, it was, it was much worse then. And that is the story of how Tennessee became the state capital and how in the middle of it was a guy named Sneed from Williamson County. Okay, we've done the state capital, we've done the steamboat. Now I wanna talk about the telegraph. Um, how many of you are old enough to have sent or received a telegraph? I actually did it once on a Navy ship. I can't, I, I, I didn't occur to me at the time, but I thought, you know, I, I should have thought, this is the only time I'm ever gonna do this. Before the telegraph, it took between three and six weeks for news to make its way from New York or Washington to Nashville. It took weeks for people in Nashville to learn who won the presidential race. And it took about a month to learn about the Battle of New Orleans. Okay? We learned it from people who came back and said, guess what we did a month ago? Okay? Uh, and, and this was the case until the telegraph was invented. And um, there was a man named Samuel Morse whose profession was painter. He was not a, an electrician, or a, but he, he dabbled around in inventing things. And uh, on a voyage from um, Great Britain to the United States on a ship, uh, he and another man named Charles Thomas Jackson would sit there at the bar and have long talks about, about electricity. People had known about electricity for years. Benjamin Franklin had conducted experiments with it 80 years earlier, but no one had found a way to really use it profitably. During their long talks, Morris and Jackson talked about the idea that the electric current could be created and then broken and then created and broken again in a series of patterns that it could be used for long distance communication. Um, Morris was so excited when he got to New York that he started doing experiments with electricity, but he wasn't the only person working on it. Other scientists were already trying to find a way to use electricity to communicate long distance, which is why we really can't just call Morris the inventor of the telegraph. It's more complicated than that. It's all inventions are more complicated than that, you know. What Morse eventually did, along with the help of uh, Leonard Gale and Alfred Vail, was to come up with a series of circuits and relays that allowed the telegraph to send messages long distance. On January 6th of 1838, Morse and Vail demonstrated their invention by sending a message along two miles of electric wire at the Speedwell Iron Works in Morristown, New Jersey. You might have thought this uh, demonstration would have gotten everyone's attention, but it really didn't. A message sent along a two mile long wire was one thing, but people still didn't think you could send a message 20 or 30 miles. To demonstrate that, uh, Morris needed a lot of money, which he didn't have. He also needed a lot of help from the government. You see, back then you couldn't just run 20 miles of wire from one place to the other, unless you owned a 20 mile long strip of land. But the federal government didn't pay for or even allow this sort of thing in 1838. There was nothing in the Constitution about a person having the right to string telegraph lines all over the place, which is why members of Congress scratched their heads when Morris asked them to help him. I have a friend from college who's a member of a political party that says, if it's not in the Constitution, we can't do it. And I said, I said to him, okay, so you don't think we should have airplanes, right? So what are you talking about? I'm like, well, you think every state should regulate the airplane so when we get to the state line, they land, and then they have to do the, you know, the, the, we say, oh, we can do that. We can, let, we can allow the federal, the federal government to, do, to, do, to manage the air. I'm like, okay, well, then you just said the Constitution. And I said, you don't think we should have interstates? Or, anyway, but it's funny. If you think about the Constitution, there's a lot of things that over the years people have scratched their head and said, well, that's not in the Constitution. Do y'all know, know why we have time zones? What institutions came up with time zones? Railroads. railroads. Before they happened, railroads, trains were crashing. Because every town had its own time zone. Nashville's time zone was different than Clarksville's, which was different than Knoxville's, which is different than Huntsville's. There were probably 350 time zones in the United States before that time. And what did people say? Well, the Constitution doesn't say anything about what time zones. And so people were really slow to take to it. Well, people were slow to take to this. So finally, in 1843, the U.S. House of Representatives voted 89 to 80 to, get, to allocate $30,000 and give Morse the legal right to string a telegraph line a long distance. Morse and his friends, that is not Morse, by the way. That is somebody that gets paid less than him. Morse and his friends got to work laying a telegraph line all the way from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. It wasn't easy. After all, copper wires are hard to come by 
and 38 miles of copper wire did not exist. A company had to be hired to make the wire, long poles had to be purchased to hold the wire, and men had to be paid to stick the poles in the ground and string the wire to the top of them. This took time and patience, and Morris's mood was up one minute and down the next. This is a diorama that I took a picture of at the B&O Railroad Museum in Baltimore, where there's an entire room devoted to the telegraph. On May 5th, 1844, May 25th, a group of businessmen and elected officials gathered around a funny-looking electronic device in the Capitol building in Washington, while another group of men gathered around another funny-looking electronic device at a railroad office in Baltimore. Morris at one end typed in a series of dots and dashes into a machine that would have looked to us like a cross between a stapler and a small cash register. Vale, 40 miles away and on the other end of the wire, translated the dots and dashes into a four-word message. What were those words? What hath God wrought? It's a Jeopardy question. I've seen it on Final Jeopardy twice, okay? The dots and dashes came out one at a time and Vale translated them using the code that he and Morris had come up with. The first letter was W, the second was H, etc. It was a, a Bible verse that someone has suggested. Numbers 23, 23. What hath God wrought? Uh, the newspaper that reported it the next day, it was a really short editorial. Baltimore Sun, but they really, they got to the point. Second sentence. Uh, Telegraph has already, during the first week of its operation, been proven to be of the greatest public importance. Time and space has been completely annihilated. That is also a Jeopardy question. I've seen that as a final Jeopardy. What were they talking about? Time and space has been completely annihilated. What is the Telegraph? So, um, very quickly, the world changes. Morris now had the world's attention and as many investors as he needed. He and his partners formed a business called Magnetic Telegraph Company to build telegraph lines to New York City, Philadelphia, Boston, Buffalo, and other large cities. Well, wait a minute. What about the South? Okay, are we not going to get the telegraph? Well, Morris would also sign an agreement with a man named Henry O'Reilly, who started another business called the Atlantic and Ohio Telegraph Company. It was this company that extended telegraph lines to Cincinnati, Louisville, and Nashville. It's called the Atlantic and Ohio Telegraph Company. So how do you think it's going to work? One company building telegraph lines to one part of the country? Handshake deal. You think it's going to work out? How do you think this is going to work? Well, it's not going to work out. It'll, make, it'll eventually make its way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, anyway, the lines were installed at about the rate of 10 miles a day through Kentucky. I wish I could have seen this. Um, Heading south from Louisville, O'Reilly and his crew showed up in Nashville on or about Tuesday, February 24th, 1848, sticking poles in the ground and attaching wire to the top of them as fast as they could. The newspapers seemed to think they would have it working the next day. Then you look at the next day and the next day and the next day. It took about two weeks. I can see them now saying, well, I want to work now. And then they had to go all the way back to Louisville trying to figure out if there's a single break in this line. Can you imagine? be worse than when you try to get your electrical system at home working. This is a, one of the newspapers that came out on that day and it says, as our paper is going to press this evening, the long expected apparatus of the chief of lightning men, they were called lightning men, uh, Mr. O'Reilly is coming across the public square followed by a crowd of men and boys staring at the novel apparat arrangements making to enable the people of Nashville to talk with those of Louisville. Blah, blah, blah. This is February 24th. It would be until March 7th, that we found in the newspaper an item at the top of the front page. The O'Reilly Telegraph line went into operation at 11 o'clock this morning and worked beautifully. The first news received was the arrival of the Britannia at Boston on Saturday. We make that our first story. So, top of the front page, the Britannia arrived at Washington on Saturday. Have you ever heard of the Britannia? I never have. I can only tell you that it amuses me to think that when people were walking up to each other that day in Nashville, they were saying, hey, did you know that the Britannia arrived at Boston? Why do I care? Well, I don't know, but it just happened on Saturday, and it's just Monday. So this is the first time that news has made its way to Nashville other than by, you know, verbal. 
Oh, and so how does the world change? Well, remember it took like five weeks for the news of the Battle of New Orleans to get here? I was, I, I was curious about this. The National Daily Union on July 4th, 1863 has a story about what's about to be a battle between Gettysburg and Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. That's amazing. I always thought it, they didn't know. No, they knew because of the telegraph. So they, they, were, they would find out Civil War stuff within like a day or two. And, but, but, you know, before that time, it was weeks. Think about how much that changes your life, okay? Uh, I mean, as soon as we're done, y'all going to turn your cell phones on and find out if anything's happened in the last 25 minutes. Well, that's not the way our great-great-great-grandparents lived. And, and this would have been shocking to them. So it, anyway, if you look at Tennessee's newspapers before 1845, you will notice that they generally reported national news three weeks or so after it happened. But after, about, uh, after, after 1845, you will notice that national news was reported even days or even hours after it happened. So it changes everything, all because of the telegraph. But this also means that cotton prices are changing. There was a story in early Tennessee history of a man who was in Philadelphia. His name was Yateman, and he was a capitalist, and he found out that cotton prices had skyrocketed. And he said to himself, hmm, I can get back to Nashville faster than the postman. So he got a fast horse and, and took his horse all the way back as fast as he could, bought up all the cotton he could, made a killing, and ended up cornering the market and, and ended up as one of the richest men in town. His name was Yateman. And uh, have you ever seen the, um, the iron furnace in um, 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 Stewart County that's called the Bear Spring Furnace? Well, he died a few years later, but he had bought up an iron business. When he died, they had to auction 500 slaves. That's how rich he was. Only t and it was all because, because he had made his way back faster than the postman. So. Anyway, since that day, News has made its way instantly to Tennessee via telegraph, later by telephone, later by television, and now by internet, okay? So that changes everything. So what about Morse? A postscript about Morse and O'Reilly. By the time the telegraph arrived in Nashville, the partnership between the two men had become a, had become a hated rivalry and a lawsuit. That case, O'Reilly v. Morse, made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and Morse won the case. The high court ruled in his favor, causing the collapse of O'Reilly's business empire. So the man who brought the telegraph to Louisville, Cincinnati, and Nashville uh, basically lost everything in a lawsuit. When he died in 1886, newspapers in Tennessee made a small mention of it, pointing out that he had been a prominent citizen of Rochester, New York, but no one pointed out that it was this guy who had brought the telegraph to Nashville. And it's interesting to think that Supreme Court that decided O'Reilly versus Morse, that was the same year as what other case? The Dred Scott decision. So this court is the same court that ruled on the Dred Scott decision, ruled on what is definitely the first case of its time involving intellectual property. To this day, a lot of times they'll, they'll go back to the O'Reilly uh, versus Morse case. It's kind of the first case that... that that they still think about, you know, who, who owns this intellectual property? Well, how do we define it in 1854? Now for the railroad. Okay. Um, are any of you in this picture? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Before 1810, Nashville was a river town. Remember, it was the flatboats and the steamboats. As far as products and produce were concerned, everything that left or came to Nashville came by flatboat before 1820 and steamboat after 1820. The town was entirely dependent on the Cumberland River and the stagecoach companies, and there were stagecoach companies. I love looking at these ads, and I have no idea what these guys are doing, but all I can say is once these horses start working, these guys are gonna start falling off the back of this way. The, the stagecoach ads are hilarious, because you know that they're exaggerating how quickly they can get somebody from here to there, and yet they're bragging about the fact that they can get you all the way to Knoxville in only two days and two hours, okay? So people didn't travel very much, okay? There were no long, there were no weekend getaways. Everything would change with the creation of the Nashville and Chattanooga Railway. By the way, there were weekend getaways, but they were to like the Mineral Resort Hotel on the other side of the county. 
and I may do another book on those, but there were three or four in Williamson County alone that you would go to and just drink the mineral water. And, and that was Bonacqua Springs or, you know, Kingston Springs or something like that. Anyway, everything changed with the creation of this railroad. Around 1845, State Senator James Overton and newspaper editor A.O.P. Nicholson began organizing support for new railroad to Chattanooga. The idea of the railroad was to hook up with another railroad called the Western Atlantic, which was then under construction from Savannah to Chattanooga. This railroad would be called the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad. It would give Middle Tennessee's farmers access to Atlantic coast markets, plus give Nashville access to untapped coal reserves in southwest Tennessee. It would also mean, and listen to this sentence, that produce of Middle Tennessee would make it to the open sea in about one-fifth the cost in about one-tenth the time, okay? And the man who ended up being in charge of this, Overton and Nichols, uh, Nicholson hired, this man was Vernon K. Stevenson. And he ended up being the main person who raised money for this project, and he soon became president of the railroad. Stevenson went door-to-door -door selling stock in the new venture, and in the fall of 1847, he raised money in small communities throughout Middle Tennessee. I love these... You talk about, you think you have a busy life. Well, he spoke in a different town every night. Jefferson, Bond Store, Milton, Ready Store, Milton, Murfreesboro, you've heard of Murfreesboro. Basically from here all the way west and most, or excuse me, southeast. Most of these places don't go by these names anymore. Um, but it was one place after another to try to get people to buy stock. And yeah, I guess if you, if you bought stock, you were more likely to have the railroad, if not, then the railroad might miss your town. I'm not sure about that. In the end, uh, a lot of people did buy stock, but also the governments of Nashville and Charleston, South Carolina, would ensure the project's success by investing more than $500,000 each. You know how we're, in, we're funding $3 billion stadiums for the Titans today? Yeah. Well, not we, but people in Nashville. That all started with this. This was the first time the government and a government in Tennessee had bought, you know, had invested in a company. And yes, there were people who challenged it and took it all the way to the Tennessee Supreme Court, and the Tennessee Supreme Court ruled that it was okay. So that was the first time. All corporate welfare goes back to this. Surveying crews began laying the rail line in 1847. Since a straight line between Nashville and Chattanooga crosses the Cumberland Plateau at a steep place. The engineer, who ends up being one of the most important people in Tennessee history, <clears throat> chose a 152-mile route through Rutherford, Bedford, and Franklin counties and into northeast Alabama, where it turned east at the Tennessee River and headed to Chattanooga from there. Several towns were created in this process, including Deckard and Cowan, Tennessee, both of whom are named for railroad executives, and Stevenson and Bridgeport, Alabama. Stevenson got a town name after him. Anyway, the construction project included a 2,200-foot tunnel through the Cumberland Plateau at Franklin County. This tunnel was dug by hand, pick, and shovel. The most technically advanced thing at the disposal of the workers who dug it was dynamite. If there were people in Nashville who did not understand the magnitude of the project, they understood it on December 14th of 1850. That's when a steamboat called the Beauty hauled a locomotive to Nashville. And obviously, this is the first locomotive that anyone had ever seen before because it came on boat, okay? And along, the, uh, along with the locomotive, the steamboat brought 13 freight cars and one passenger car. I would love to have seen them un unload this steamboat. <coughs> mules, mules are the heroes in early Tennessee history, dragged the locomotive, freight cars, <coughs> and passenger cars to the Nashville and Chattanooga Terminal in the spring of 1851, the train made its first trip, 11 miles. What's 11 miles from Nashville to the southeast? Oh, that's more like 100 miles. <coughs> Antioch. They took it to Antioch. And let me tell you something. You had to be important to be on that first train to Antioch. And I, 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 I think it's safe to say that the most glorious day in the history of Antioch was the day that train... I mean, you had to be... That would be like being at the Titan Stadium when the first game. I mean, they, and the people got out of the train <coughs> and said, wow, this is Antioch. <coughs> and they got back on the train and went back to Nashville. It was a glorious and exciting day for Tennessee State Capitol. 
Only important and well-connected got to ride in that first train. So from that point onward, they would add another town and another town. By Ju July 4th, they made it all the way to Murfreesboro, where there was a celebratory dinner attended by 4,000 people. That's a lot of people to feed. Anyway, here's a typical editorial. Uh, it's remarkable how railroads seem to create business, the banner reported on March 9th of 1852. All of life is hustle and bustle in whatever country they penetrate. There were stories about this, stories about that. It was all positive. Or was it? I just want to point out this railroad. Because at the time, the newspapers were really putting focus on the positive sides of this. A lot of the enthrallment and publicity peaked in March of 1851 <coughs> when the tunnel through the Cumberland Mountain was completed. The next slide shows an item that appeared in the Buffalo, New York newspaper. Buffalo, New York. They have a story about a tunnel in Tennessee in a place called Franklin County, just south of what is now called Cowan. So this is a big deal for Tennessee, a lot of publicity. But here's the thing, I, I, I just want to give you a little dose of reality. Uh, like every other railroad built in the South, the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad was built by people who weren't paid very much, certainly by modern standards, who risked their lives and health more than American workers would today, and who in some places were enslaved, okay? I had a, a guy who ran the Cowan Railroad Museum down in Cowan who swore to me that there were no slaves who worked on the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad. And I believed him. And so I put on my website that there were no slaves. And then about a year later, I found these ads. I'm like, you made me look like an idiot. And he goes, well, I didn't know. I'm like, of course there were slaves. Anyway, some of the people who worked on the railroad were professional engineers who had been trained in colleges, most notably West Point. But by the end of 1852, the Nashville and Chattanooga <clears throat> Railroad had hired at least 100 enslaved people to lay track, repair track, and do general maintenance between Murfreesboro and Cowan. Meanwhile, a private contractor called Murdoch and Townsend advertised that it needed to hire an additional 500 slaves to work on the line between the Tennessee River Bridge in northeast Alabama and Chattanooga. That stretch included an especially large amount of blasting and moving of rock. For instance, where the railroad wound around Lookout Mountain. And they didn't really have the current engineer know-how that we have today. They would like blast an area and then clear it. And then they come back the next Monday and then all the rocks had fallen down. They had to do it again. You know, th this, was, this was all very new. Anyway, these enslaved people were sent away from their families and households to be leased to the railroad for months or even years the railroad might pay the slaveholder around $150 a year for their labors. The enslaved people would be clothed and fed at the railroad's expense and would sleep in tent-like quarters near where they would work. And I, I think we can assume that they would all be wearing chains, okay? And, okay. Meanwhile, there appear to be more immigrants working on the railroad than slaves. The National and Chattanooga Railroad hired hundreds of Irish immigrants the moment they got off the ship at Castle Garden, New York and sent them straight to Tennessee. Has anyone ever heard of Castle Garden, New York? Because a lot, a lot, my family would have come through Castle Garden, not Ellis Island. Ellis Island was like after 1885 or something, but Castle Garden, and a lot more came through Castle Garden than came through Angel Island in San Francisco. So I don't know why we don't talk more about that. Anyway, far away, far from their homeland, Sometimes these immigrants had too much to drink after hours. Uh, there's a number of stories about riots at the tunnel and the Irish laborers, and some of them are more funny than others. On October 1850, the Nashville Union reported a riot between Irish and natives, the natives being Tennesseans. A bad feeling has existed for some time between the two parties, but on Sunday night, having taken a sufficient quantity of rot gut whiskey to arouse their worst passions. I didn't know that was a brand label. <laughs> Give me some rot gut whiskey. Um, a fuss was raised in which several men were badly used up, but fortunately nobody killed. On the next day, locals destroyed the local Irish saloon using something they had plenty of, uh, which was gunpowder. They blew it to smithereens, okay? The greater danger, however, was disease. On July 13th, cholera spread among railroad workers working on the National and Chattanooga Railroad Tunnel, south of Cowan. 
According to a story in the Winchester Independent, the first victim was a woman named Mrs. Mills, who died about a day after she fell ill. The second death was Edward Paul, a native of Cornwall, England, and one of the superintendents on the tunnel construction. He was a married man, and he expected his wife here from Pennsylvania on today's stagecoach, the, Pens the newspaper reporter. <clears throat> By the time this small item went to press, six other people died of cholera, including one child. Then on August 2nd, the Independent listed names of 28 people near the tunnel who died of disease, including four enslaved people and six children. However, the newspaper maintained that the town of Winchester, only seven miles away, had escaped the scourge. It made no mention of law enforcement efforts that the town would have made to keep diseased workers away from town, although there is no doubt that there would have been some. There would absolutely no doubt there would have been people with guns, and if anyone comes near the town, they say, turn around and go back or I'll open fire on you. Okay. Then there were the accidents of a different sort. Who would have thought it? There were at least five train crashes on the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad, even during the phase of its existence where only parts of it were open, which was remarkable considering how slowly the trains were moving. The first accident took place in October of 1851 when a locomotive, passenger car, and freight car ran off the tracks at Overall Creek in Rutherford County. It is astonishing that every person on them was not killed. The only person who was killed was an African-American man, almost certainly an enslaved one, whose name did not even make the paper. On the, so on the one hand, the Nashville and Chattanooga Railroad had its share of wonderful achievements. That first ride from Nashville to Antioch and the opening of the tunnel in Cowan were among the achievements, but also encountered tragedies such as the cholera pandemic and the early train accident. And it needs to be remembered that many of the men blasting rock, moving dirt, hauling logs into place, and hammering in rails were enslaved, while others were immigrants in a new land. This is the railroad map. We don't have to read these anymore. It's kind of interesting to teach kids how to read them today. The accidents, the delays, the epidemics, the labor <coughs> problems, and the cost overruns may account for the following. When Nashville was finally connected to Chattanooga, the newspapers treated it with more relief than celebration. On Saturday, January 15th of 1854, this date had, I had, it took me forever to find this date, but this ends up being probably one of the most important dates in Tennessee history. The locomotive of <laughs> Tennessee crossed the Nashville and Chattanooga Bridge over the Tennessee River just east of the town that later became known as Bridgeport, Alabama. The train rolled into Chattanooga two days later. So this is a train that left Nashville, made it all the way to Chattanooga. So this is the first time Nashville is connected to another city by railroad. And by the way, Nashville got a railroad before Memphis and before Knoxville. Henceforth, there will be an uninterrupted communication by railroad between Nashville and Montgomery, Alabama, Charleston, and Savannah, the banner reported. What town did, what town did they not even mention? Do what? Atlanta. Atlanta hardly existed yet. 1854, Atlanta doesn't exist. I mean, it's, you know, it's not, as, not as important as Savannah and Charleston and Montgomery and Nashville. Did I say? Um, I'm sorry, what? Oh, that's a typo. 1854. Do y'all know what Atlanta's original name was? Terminus. Terminus of the railroad. Atlanta is a form of the Atlantic Ocean. I think Mar no, Marthasville was after Terminus. Yeah, Terminus was the, rail the name that the railroad engineer gave it. This will be the Terminus of the railroad. For a couple years they called it that, and then they called it Marthasville. Anyway, it, this was the third time in 36 years that Nashville had experienced a monumental change. July of 1818, the arrival of the first steamboat in Nashville. Before that time, you per pretty much couldn't get upstream. You could, but it was really slow. It was quicker to take a horse, okay? March of 1848, the first telegraph message broadcast to Nashville. So for the first time, we're going to find out who won the presidential election in November, okay? And then in January 54, the first connection with the outside world via railroad. I think all this puts the change we have experienced since 1986 in context. Because I remember 1986, and I remember, yeah, the Internet has changed a lot of things. But I still took my car to get here tonight. In fact, my car is 20 years old, so I'm embarrassed to say. It might have been the same car. But, but 
we still took cars on roads and we still watch TV. I don't think the world has actually changed nearly as much as it did here. Because, you know, this is one of these, you know, if you had slept like Rip Van Wake over 20 years, you would have woke up and said, what? You know, we can get from here to there. We don't have to take the stagecoach anymore. So uh, anyway, that's kind of the, the theme of my book. Um, see, these are... Uh, I'll probably talk about 25 pages in the book. There, there's a... Do any of you get Tennessee Magazine? Yeah. Okay. Like I write a, I write a column for Tennessee Magazine. The idea of the book originally was, was to put a lot of these columns down in a book. And, uh, and then what happened was, I, as I kind of went through them, I said, what is the recurring theme here? And the recurring theme is just how much the world changed between the first of these things and the last. And one of the things I point out in the chapter is, I'm sure people in 1854 thought, man, let's just have a few years without any change, okay? <laughs> what was coming? The Civil War. The Civil War. And so, you know, no, no. They weren't going to have a few years without change. Um, Y'all have any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. I, I really appreciate your uh, emphasis on the change and what the change was. And what struck me about the telegraph, as I've done some research on that, was up till then, everybody had written things that they could hold in their hand, or they saw the person talking. And now suddenly the information is coming out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. That's huge. Now that, that, that must have been so um, bewildering to them. How did, they, how did that message come? Well, I'm sure when they got to Telegraph, it wasn't obvious that, okay, every town's just going to have one of these. Like, the telephone later became something everyone has. But, you know, only... Does anyone here ever learn Morse code? You did? In the military? Uh, ham radio. Do what? Ham radio. Ham oh, ham oh, you radio. did? Okay. I, I, I remember Morse code when I was in the Navy but I could only recognize the three-letter identifier of my own base. So I know what N-U-Q is. That's it. But obviously that would have been a marketable skill. And, um, the one, one other thing, and I, I, I wish I'd gotten into it, but there's a, there's a chapter about a photograph that's at the top of the front page of the cover of the book. Um, photography was introduced and it was still pretty rare but you will see ads for photographers sure it was a lot of money by those standards but you'll see ads like in the 1840s for a photographer you can and there's a picture that is not part of the library of congress collection and it's james k polk his wife um mr his secretary of state whose name was buchanan Later pre gov uh, president, and then a woman named Dolly Madison, who had been the first lady 40 years before then. And it, it's a remarkable photograph because it ends up with, I think, two presidents and three first ladies in this photograph. And then a man standing behind him whose name is Cave Johnson. He's the first postmaster general. He'd been at the post since then. I don't know. But, but, you know, I have a whole chapter about this. This, uh, this photograph, because no one even knows why they took it. But this ends up being the first photograph ever taken of a president that's not just him. It's in a group. So that was also changing. Any other questions or comments? If you want to buy a book, I'm charging $25, which is about 10% discount. I have to pay the tax. There's no getting around that. So I'll send it in, but uh, but I have I do cash, check, or Venmo. Anyone here do Venmo? One person. <laughs> when I talk to Boy Scouts, they're like, "Oh yeah, I do Venmo, Terry." I'm like, "Well, this is it, bro." Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful.